Well, thanks very much, Tom, and uh, to Andrew Blythe, the two uh, principal organisers of today. Um, John Howard, of course, um, the man who uh, is, is the reason, I think, why we're all here today, the longest, second longest serving Prime Minister in our history, who built on the success, his success, and the, the success of others in 1996. Could I also thank David Kemp for a, a, a very solid foundation that you've placed for the day, and could I endorse the comments that you made about the significance of this uh, retrospective initiative here today. Um, the 1996 election uh, is the largest Liberal win in history ever, and of course um, it began the Prime, Minister, Prime Ministerial career of John Howard, the second longest serving Prime Minister in Australia's history. Now against that outcome um, in 1996, the task set us today to comment on the events of 1996 with the benefit of hindsight to nominate at least three failures or frailties in either the conduct of the campaign or in the first year of the Howard government and to provide a personal perspective, um, that is, what we did think or feel or do in 96, um, I found fairly difficult um, against that outcome. Um, in all honesty, while others might be more clear-headed today, uh, for those in the thick of things in the campaign, it's not easy afterwards to be objective, especially if you win by such a large margin. Uh, winners are grinners, and I fear the grin only gets wider with the uh, affluxion of time, but, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, equally, the first term of the Howard government um, had many difficult moments, but the record shows, I think, and it's not properly appreciated, the record shows that the list of reforms in that first term is really quite, quite remarkable. And it tells you something about the importance of the first term of a new government. Budget reform, which set Australia up economically for the next decade. The gun buyback, a program now globally admired. Waterfront reform under the most difficult of circumstances. Independence of the Reserve Bank. Introduction of work for the dole. The Telstra privatisation, or partial at that stage, which funded the $1 billion National Environment Trust. A, a billion dollars meant something at that stage. I can remember the, uh, the, the, the drawing of breath from so many people when we announced a billion dollars to go towards the environment. Um, Today it's meaningless, that sort of a, that number. The industrial relation reforms, including the individual contracts, of course, which have subsequently been um, eliminated by the Rudd government, um, which delivered remarkable productivity gains through the next 10 years, just remarkable gains. And the decision, of course, to introduce a GST and then campaign on that decision um, and win the subsequent election with, with that policy front and square. It is a remarkable combination, and I've only really chosen the highlights. There were many other reforms, despite uh, some difficulties at the beginning, which I'll come back to a bit later. It, it could arguably be seen as constituting most of the reforms. Uh, a lot of them took then years to bed down and to implement properly. But um, the reforms done in that first three years, uh, I do feel, contributed to making the subsequent Howard years for most Australians, uh, dare I say it, relaxed and comfortable. The adroit political handling of the Senate numbers, uh, we were close, but we didn't have the Senate numbers, but we had Senator Brian Harradine and the um, infamous Mel Colston. Um, but the handling of those two uh, made a lot of that possible. Again, finding fault with such a golden period of reform, uh, I think could be seen as uh, somewhat precious. The difficulty in finding serious fault in the 1996 election is not, I feel, a function of the fact that I was the campaign director and the federal director in 96. I had exactly the same responsibilities in the 93 election campaign yet uh, I could very easily write a tome on the mistakes that I and others made in that campaign. Um, I, can, I, had to, I can recall, um, I'll never forget in fact, the, the night that we lost that election, 
sitting at 1am in the morning after years of very hard work and uh, a strong, heavy campaign to be there at 1am in the morning sitting with John Gall preparing for um, the morning after uh, interview with uh, Laurie Oakes. Um, and I sat there thinking um, how keenly I felt the weight of sheer disappointment and the, the weight of responsibility for that disappointment of more than four million loyal supporters who confronted a totally unexpected loss. It, it was a devastating feeling. And it had an impact, um, not only on me, but on so many others. In fact, uh, I spent several agonising months post the 93 election reflecting on the campaign mistakes. And in my case, much of it was a function, I think, of inexperience. Fortunately for me, and I hope ultimately for the party, I learned more from that loss than I had, I think I had learnt uh, through my entire professional career to that point. I determined never to be in such a position again if, the, if given the opportunity to continue with those responsibilities, which fortunately I was. For the three year lead up to the 1996 campaign and ever since, uh, I think I've run scared, assuming problems will emerge. If you and your team are constantly in that state of mind, the inevitable problems that emerge are dealt with far more quickly and effectively because you're not caught off guard or complacent. And I saw um, when John Howard took over that he brought that, that quality in, in spades um, of never assuming that the, the next day uh, was going to be the same as the current day or that success would, would follow. And again, it's experience. If issue after issue was anticipated and prepared for in the two years prior to the 96 election, issues and approaches informed by a litany of mistakes in 1993. By the time the final 33-day campaign arrived, over, for over 12 months we had been embedding the campaign strategy and the themes and values, the values that David Kemp so importantly identified, into our campaign teams and candidates around Australia, especially the 30 most marginal seats. Also, I think the old dictum that your strengths are also your weaknesses was borne out between 93 and 96. In 93, Paul Keating's strength of character was critical in convincing people to stay with the devil they knew rather than the devil they didn't in a highly uncertain and difficult economic environment post the recession. The flip side of this strength was arrogance, which emerged in spades following the 93 victory. Many will recall Keating's utterances, the sweetest victory of all, the victory of the true believers. You've never had it so good. Go get a job. All of these and many more uh, memorable quotes, and we're very grateful in the campaign to have that material to uh, <laughs> keep reminding him, and, but particularly the, the electorate. In 1996, we exposed the cost to the community of such an arrogant leader who had lost the ability to focus on the priorities of, of all but an elite group within the community. Again, shades of what David was talking about. Paul Keating no longer got angry about the things most Australians were angry about. To understand and properly assess then the 1996 Liberal campaign, you do have to look back at the previous years of both Labor and the Coalition. You've got to assess a campaign in the context uh, in which the campaign was fought. And that context can be sometimes built over many, many years. There were three elements, I felt, uh, principally, which, um, uh, which created a context uh, in which we were able to execute what we did in that uh, campaign. Firstly, the Keating recession we had to have in 1991, uh, in 1990 and 91. And, and the profound impact that interest rates uh, of 14 per cent, and I could remember, I, was, I had interest rates, our family did, uh, for family homes, and up to 22 per cent for small businesses. Uh, interest rates, uh, and these were largely people who subsequently became known as the Howard Battlers. Secondly, the large migration of blue collar voters to the Liberals owed much to Labor's attempts over 15 years, right back to the 70s, really. They, they, after Whitlam sought to 
to, uh, and he did appeal to the uh, pro socially progressive, and they saw that socially progressive, the question earlier about uh, university educated, but largely, uh, largely coming out of the uh, middle class university educated groups in the community. Um, and Labor um, progressively started to reflect and focus on that group. And we did see um, 15 years of chasing the votes of the socially progressive, university educated, affluent end of middle class Australia. Along the way, Keating and his colleagues came to reflect, reflect far more closely the values and the priorities of that narrow group, in many ways values and priorities at odds with those of workers and their families. And I think they still confront this problem. They're basically trying to weld onto their base a group whose values are fundamentally um, opposite in many cases to their traditional base of, of workers and their families. And we saw that opportunity to go and um, capture the workers and their families. In many ways, we didn't really appeal um, to that, uh, well, we didn't have them as a target in any sense, really, the socially progressive, um, highly educated. Um, of course, we, um, not all of, the, all of that category, not all of the uh, university educated, as was, was mentioned earlier, are in that category. The Howard campaign, in that sense, was a values-based campaign, as David intimated. Um, and not unlike, in a way, the, uh, the Reagan Democrats in the 80s in the United States, which is also very much a values-based campaign. From where I sat, Labor finished up in a cocoon of political correctness, a cocoon spun tightly by vocal minority groups and a union movement sadly sidetracked. Labor failed to get angry about the things Australians were angry about. Labor ended up governing for a few and not for all of us. Some of you might remember that turn of phrase. Firstly, uh, finally I'd say, the, the great breach of trust by Paul Keating's government associated with the huge tax hike only five months uh, after defeating the coalition budget, five months after defeating us in 93, uh, on a campaign where we were seeking to introduce a goods and services tax in 93. Um, Paul Keating um, destroyed us in the way in which he attacked that, but then the implication to the electorate was that he was not a high taxing Prime Minister and they were not going to be a high taxing government, and yet five months later they introduced almost a version of GST with a, a very substantial $10 billion of ramping of wholesale sales tax, which was, you know, the first cousin of a GST. Um, these three factors, the fallout from the 1990-91 recession, the failure of Labor to get angry about the things Middle Australia was angry about, and the distrust of Labor stemming from broken promises following that election, it all formed, those three things really formed a strategic framework in which we sought to defeat Labor in 1996. On the Liberal side, again looking at the context, the previous 13 years of opposition combined with the sickening impact of the 1993 election loss where we failed to win what was termed the unlosable election had major consequences on both the organisational and parliamentary wings of the party. Between 93 and 96, my observation was that many in our party displayed a necessary resolve and ruthlessness not normally associated with our party. We went through three leaders, and it wasn't just, the, it was a sort of necessary process, but people knew if we didn't, if we didn't turn things around by 1996, uh, there would be enormous fragmentation and uh, conflict within our own party in subsequent years. So there was a, a, a really an unspoken but, but uh, common resolve that you could see across the organisational and parliamentary wings. and. The personal, personal ambitions had to be, uh, the, that were not con contributing, <laughs> had to be dealt with. And um, uh, it, there was a, 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 it was a, a great sense of, of teamwork that, uh, that developed through that period. Uh, candidate selection and support, including the promotion of women candidates. I think how many did we end up with? 27 women in the parliamentary party. It was 
and, and they made a huge contribution um, to the success uh, and the longevity, I think, of the, of the Howard government. Marginal seat preparation, uh, mobilisation of our supporters, changes to federal party organisational powers, networking with community groups, procedures for policy development, relations with the National Party and the coalition state governments, our research program, our work in regional areas, staff training, all the way through to the smooth transition to John Howard and the subsequent discipline and focus under his leadership were matters dealt with more effectively than many could remember in the party. That sense of unity, of course, you, you, you just can't win without unity. Um, it's it's a, a fundamental plank uh, of success. Most importantly, um, the 1993 campaign taught me that a necessary, if not sufficient, condition of success, apart from unity, is your strategy. And I found this subsequently in business, um, and again back in politics uh, when I stood for Parliament in 2004. Uh, the strategy, and it is basically how you position in the eyes of the community the outcome of the proposed program of policies. Where are you going to take the community to? You know, what sort of, um, what sort of environment are we going to create? How are we going to improve things for, for all Australians? Uh, and and what, what is our ambition? In many ways, I think getting a strategy right is 80% of the battle. How it's then executed is 20%. Getting close here, I've got only 10 minutes left, I've got to tell. Um, five, is it? Yeah. Um, Yes, how you execute it is 20%. For example, if the community's at point A and uh, they want to go to point B in terms of their quality of life and all the rest of it, their job opportunities, yet you're offering them to take them to point C, no matter how well you execute your strategy, you're likely to fail unless the opposition is equally diluted. In the recent federal election campaign, one, ele one element on which coalition campaign was taking the community to a place created by greater innovation. It produced, I think, very mixed results. Despite what is asserted, most Australians do understand that innovation creates jobs and opportunities. But for whom is, is the issue? They're not stupid or irrational um, in terms of their opposition by some people to um, such a program. They do understand that it does create jobs. For a segment of the, our community, this innovation presented new opportunity and jobs for them. They could see immediately a place for them and the opportunities for them. For other, another segment, uh, this proposition meant new jobs, but new jobs for others, not them. These people saw new high-tech jobs replacing their existing job, leading to job loss, new training, <coughs> likely family relocation and great disruption to their lives. So they were the ones that they saw paying for the opportunities that others would, would get. Many of these voters are the swing voter defined as Howard Battlers in 1996. So it's really critical in the strategic sense to um, reflect as best you can. Politics is about reconciling hundreds of competing interests, but you've got to try and reflect as best you can um, the ambitions and desires and wants of, um, of large segments of the community. Um, in 1993, the coalition brought down an 800-page policy manifesto at the end of a major recession. Um, this was called by some people an 800-page political suicide note, but uh, this so-called fight-back document um, meant too much risk for many households and small businesses who were in a very poor financial state coming out of the recession. Now, the, what was in that document was, in my view, not the problem, it was the presentation and the barnacles on it and uh, uh, the ammunition we gave to our opponents in a campaign. In many respects, that document, and it was contributed to by, uh, at a lot of political pain through the 80s and early 90s, uh, as there was a huge debate philosophically about this, you know, our free market ambitions and all, and all the rest. And it, that caused a lot of division, which we paid for in, in the 80s and early 90s, but it led to a document in the end which was internally consistent across so many areas of policy, 
And I must say, um, you know, we, we knocked the rough edges off for 96. We didn't throw out that policy. We, we knocked a lot of the, the, the political rough edges off. And when I, I went off into business after, at 19, in 1997 after we won, and when I got back in 2004, I could still see the Prime Minister dipping into the fight back. So I think a lot of the longevity of the Howard government owed the, to the fact that there was an agenda. There was an agenda that was able to be laid out over many, many years, and many governments arrived with no agenda and people can smell it and the, and the results prove it. After a very effective fear campaign, too many people opted for the devil they knew than the devil they didn't at that time in 93. In 96, we removed the political rough edges, as I said. We repositioned many of the policies. We sought to demonstrate that the outcome of our policies would make it to make the community, as John Howard put it, again, relaxed and comfortable. It was potent politics after years of um, hardship and uncertainty. And again, I say effective strategic positioning is at the core of uh, successful politics. Um, just a final couple of things. Um, in the 1993 election, we opened up too many fronts, as I mentioned. Um, there was a, a, a Labor scare campaign. It left a legacy of lingering negative perceptions, which we had to deal with on health and community safety nets and things. That was dealt with before the campaign. Um, and the campaign, as I said, I won't go through it, a whole series of uh, lessons that, that, that I learnt and I think were features again in 1996. Uh, perhaps the, the most costly mistake was the failure to do more preparation for transition to government. Um, again, it was a lesson we thought we'd learnt from 93. 93, we had endless seminars and, and um, the um, shadow ministers were spent a lot of time looking at the policy, and, but more importantly, the transition to government and how their department would line up and who they'd have doing this, that and the other. And after a while, I think most of them started to feel, uh, or their, their psychology was that they were already ministers. And it seriously affected, um, I thought in 93, their, uh, the fact that they were not running scared, <laughs> not chasing votes. They were, they were statesmen already, and women. So um, Prime Minister now, uh, John Howard and myself agreed in the rundown of 96 to keep it minimal, not do much, and just focus on getting there. Um, afterwards, though, there was clearly, I think, there could have been more done, not necessarily with the shadow ministers, but we had one, one major problem. There was a document, because we'd gone to the election on trust, there was a document prepared by PMNC uh, about um, ministerial behavioural guidelines. And because of all the work that was had to be done by the PM, the incoming PM, in those first few weeks, that didn't get proper scrutiny. Or he didn't get the opportunity to look at the politics of what was in it. And we then had some uh, unfortunate um, resignations, forced resignations, because of breaches of guidelines, unwitting breaches of guidelines. And these sort of things could have been a really major stumbling block that really did affect the morale and uh, the effectiveness. Fortunately, um, we regained equilibrium and went on to deliver, as I mentioned earlier, a most outstanding range of programs. The final thing, the question of understanding the importance of the context of which a campaign is fought leads me to recommend that in coming years, scholars and researchers look to compare and contrast appropriate campaigns. To me, this is where the lessons um, starkly emerge. And uh, as I've sought to try and give some insight to in the comparison of 93 and 96 and the implications. I suspect they will discover that the principles of politics, as observed by Machiavelli 500 years ago, haven't changed one whit. And that the level of adherence or not to these political dictums will correspond to, to the success or otherwise of these campaigns. Thanks very much. So if, if I hear you correctly, Gary Gray is right. You didn't win, they lost. You weren't attractive, you were just acceptable. Um. <laughs> if I well, hear that's, you correctly. Uh, well, that's, um, they made a big contribution to our success. But um, <laughs> it is the context, as like I was trying to say, it's the, it's the combination of 93 and 96 and 
many of the people, Linton Crosby, Mark Texter, um, the advertising guys we had, the gurus there. So at an organisational level, um, these, a lot of them fortunately had the opportunity to, you know, um, re we, we were able to retain that experience and, and, uh, and build on it. But also, um, the, the party had to go through a stage when, uh, when Andrew Peacock lost in 1990, um, you know, the, the instinctive reaction of the whole party was we have to go for the next generation. So John Euston gets up, and then when John Euston uh, didn't work out, there still was that mood that we've got to go to the next generation. That was sort of the, and and they went of course to Alexander Downer, and, and unfortunately um, we know what happened there. But when when Alex, um, it was obvious that he was he was unlikely to be a success for us. Um, then the whole mood just. It just changed. I mean, all of a sudden, everyone was aching for experience to take over, and um, and John Howard um, came back, and there was no no question. No one was really well. There's one guy that might have been questioning it a bit, but um, but uh, <laughs> he's busy chairing a, a television station. Um, but uh, sorry, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but uh, you know, that's so. It, it was. We did do a lot. Just. Um, we had to work through a lot of issues from the 80s and early 90s and position ourselves and take advantage of it. Uh, but Labor, um, they'd been there, in, I suspect, too long and they provided us, as we provided them with the ammunition in 1993, um, they provided us in, you know, massive ammunition in 96. Questions, please. Uh, Mr. Rob, Michael Killam, um, thanks for your uh, perspectives. Can I, um, uh, can I ask you, you were talking about uh, strategy and the importance of it, um, about the consistency of strategy um, and how long you believe it takes to message that strategy to the public, uh, mm -hmm. both so that they receive it and how long it takes for them to, uh, to understand it. Um, and you talked about the, the innovation piece uh, more, more lately. Um, if I could offer Stop the Boats as a campaign, uh, whether people agreed with it or not, certainly the message uh, resonated and, uh, and it created significant understanding about what the policy is. Uh, with retrospect, um, retrospectivity back to 96, how long do you think it takes to message a strategy to the public? Well, uh, the, the campaign is it's, it's not a 33 day, it is the three years. And people aren't living it like they do perhaps in the last few weeks. Uh, they're getting on with their lives, but they soak it up. They see whether you're not united, right? So that's, it just quietly sort of ticks away there. And they see if you, they get a sense of whether you, are you making an effort, you, you know, are you really trying to deal with issues that they're, they're concerned about? And um, so it, but, but it takes to embed into your own people, you, you know, your candidates and your parliamentarians and your, and, and even into our, um, supporters. People would often ask me in the, in the 90s, you know, what's the latest um, magical campaign technique that you've brought in from the United States? And I'd say third party endorsement, right? I mean, it, to me, the most powerful marketing, you know, if you're selling wheelbarrows, it's much better for someone else to say to you, uh, or say to a potential customer, you, you ought to get Charlie's wheelbarrows, they're fantastic rather than Charlie saying himself, you know what I mean? Third party endorsement. And we've got four million people always vote Liberal. They, they mightn't be members, uh, et cetera, but their sympathies are very much uh, according to the principles and values that we stand for. And they, they're always looking um, to see what's the answer to this issue? What's, what are we standing for? You know, what, what are the key elements of our strategy so that they can in their own way in the little workplace or the bowling club or whatever, they can respond to issues and you, you end up with all of these, you'd need a couple of years where you've got a clear, the leadership at least, have got a clear idea of how we're trying to position the party, you know, what outcome do we want for the community if we're given the privilege of government? Where are we going to take the community to? What are the priorities that we've got? What are the values that we're going to, to follow that are going to guide us in government? And it takes a couple of years I think, to get that into your own team and then to spread it through all those. And then your last 33 days, it's really a matter of, of uh, bringing that to um, a stark 
reality. You know, it is a relative business politics. Uh, they're going to vote. They're going to vote for one or the other. So you've got to demonstrate not only what you can do, not only the positive, but uh, the the alternative. What is the consequence of voting for the alternative? Hello. We've heard, heard this morning the importance of the Howard Battlers, um, people from the lower middle class, aspirational working class. Now, this, the 96 campaign occurred long before crowdsourcing was even a concept, before it was even possible. So, and election campaigns even back then were presumably very, very um, expensive. Did you have difficulty uh, reconciling the messages that went to the Battlers as opposed to the financial contributors at the big end of town? And if so, how did you um, address that? Um, no, not, not at all. I mean, I, there was a, really what we were saying is that, um, uh, you, you know, we've, we've, we've got to, we always have, we, we've got to create the pie to, um, which can then be redistributed. We don't, Labor, in my view, in, always starts with the redistribution, and then they might think later about how they're going to finance it. You know, if you're lucky, right? And um, so, so um, there was. We had never stepped away in any sense from saying we want to create the conditions. And it gets back to David's point about Menzies. That's consistent, I think, since then. We 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 want people to be given choices and responsibility as long as they, uh, given choices as long as they take responsibility for those choices, and give them opportunity, give them ambition. All the rest of it that is important about making the most of whatever talents an individual has been given. And, and that is not in any way inconsistent. In fact, it's totally consistent. We want the, we, we want the, the tradies to be very successful business people. And I tell you, from my electorate, where I came from, my old electorate on the bay in Melbourne and all the private schools, you go to the school at nine o'clock in the morning there's a, a line-up of, of tradies' vehicles dropping kids off, and, and you know, so it's, they have, we have helped create, you know, um, wealth and opportunity for a, a group of people that 20 years ago, I think, um, had far less opportunity. And once they have that opportunity, they get choices, and they've made very good, many of them, many good choices on their own behalf. So. There's absolutely no inconsistency. We want that sort of ambition that drives business to be part and parcel of uh, everyone's lives all the way down the spectrum. Okay. Would you please join with me in thanking Andrew Roth.